Episode 166. The bandwidth for this episode of The Power Factor Show is brought to you by the Firearms Radio Network. Firearmsradio.tv. Sponsored by Taylor Freelance, Rainier Ballistics, Hodgson Powders, and JPL Precision. So now you can look and see how dirty and filthy stuff is. And how do I, which, which ones do I want to start with? I'm just guessing at the order now. I'm going to try putting the sears back in and then go from there. And I'm going to use the toothpick to probably place some of these pieces and hope they stay like that just flopped over. So you're putting the springs in right now, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I'm, and I'm probably going to wish I hadn't done that in about a minute. So this is going to be back here. So is your new plan now to put the sears in first and try to slip the springs underneath yeah. them? Yeah, that's what yeah. I was thinking. So I was trying to remember, yeah, the last time that's how I wound up getting them back in. Because there's, there's nothing to hold them in. Right, right. Oh, that's a good point. After you put that spring in, there's nothing to hold. Uh -huh. It's just going to hold it down. Right. So what does hold it down? Uh, everything that's on the trigger. So you're going to have to get these things in and then manually hold them down. Oops. Well, there's a pocket in both pieces. Right. And I'm thinking if I can get it in the pocket. Things would be really good. Like that. And then not play oh, them. Oh, okay, so they're not under okay, so they're not under pressure. No. Um, yeah, they're just Bouncing out the end of the spring, okay. Oh, come on, go in there. You know you want to go in there. There, so the springs are under it. We'll see how long they stay there. So now we'll set that aside and put the trigger back together. So we've got the really short pin, we've got the rest, which goes on this spot somewhere here, this spot here. Right. And so the, the long leg points back. Points back. And it's got to be between here and there. See, that this is the hard part, is lining all of this stuff up. And we're not even at the slave pin part yet. Is that it? So the deal is, you start the pin, yeah, and then just drop the spring in it. Right, and then see that's the trick. Yeah. Whew. So now, the interesting part. And don't disturb your sear springs. Oh yeah, they're disturbed. And I'm going 
to temporarily put the hammer pin in it to hold this stuff. Okay. So, so is this the slave pin that everybody read? No, no, not right. yet. Because so I want that to hold the sears mm -hmm. and stuff in right. place. Now I'm going to beat this thing back through. Oh, yeah. Ah, but can I do that now, or do I have to have the levers in it? We'll put the levers back in it. So, and the levers, they make, it matters which side goes where because of how these things are cut at the, the back with a bevel on them. And the bevel is beveled towards the center of the trigger group. So we'll push this over just enough so that we can drop it in. And basically with the flat front of it down, okay. the bevel, the bevel, you want the high side of the bevel towards the center. of the trigger group. And there's no need to beat on these things. If it's lined up, the pin will go right in. If it's not, you can beat on it and nothing's gonna happen. So I push the pin out just enough hopefully so I can get this one in and then push it back. So we got the levers in it, which is good. And we want the levers at the back to be up so that, is it up? It's up. Up as in such that you can drive that pen under them? Is that what you mean? That's what I'm thinking. That's what I'm thinking. Yes. And that that's why that pin is there. Okay, kids, here we go. So we still have our springs under the sears. And what do I want to do? I'm going to temporarily put this pin in because it will keep the sears Sear from coming out. Yeah. So when you put this back together, you want to make sure that the rear of these levers are under the pin. Is this back all the way? Is the trigger all the way that it's going to go? So now we need to let these guys up. So that these will go down and come up. What are you doing over there? I was going to say the technical name of those levers, I believe, in the schematic here is referred to as a connecting lever. I believe you're right. I think so, yeah. Another thing it'll help limit where they're going, I think. 
are the great hammers. The hammer pin in the 692 has got a big head on it, so it'll only go in one way. lined up, it all works really good. So now, lever. So the ends of those have to be over this here? Yeah, over the top of them. Yeah. Because that's what then releases them. So now comes the slave pin, Steve. Your favorite part. So this spring looks like it's beat up pretty good. So as luck would have it, the pin that holds the selector safety oh, yeah. in is the right diameter and length. the perfect length. Mm -hmm. So when you look down in here, after we get this pin out, you can see a slot for the leg of the spring right. to go into. And it's the short end that goes in there because the long end goes all the way through this guy and has to make contact on this lever okay. and that's what gets everything going. Right. So this is going to be laying in here kind of like that and this is going to be kicking it out kind of like that. And again, when you, when you put these things together, you want to put them in the right way. So when this lever moves, you want to get the ends of the spring coming together right. rather than pulling apart. Right. Or whatever, you know, making that. Compressing it. Compressing it. Or, making yeah, it coiling tighter. the spring as opposed to opening the spring. Yeah. That's what I was trying to say. Don't do that again. Here's where I think your toothpick back from the opposite side might be. Yeah. Uh, and it likes to try to turn over. So there. So. And when you set this down in here, with this pin out of the way, you kind of want to put some downward pressure on it.
to make sure you get the short leg oh, folded going into that little slot. Okay. So look at all these pins just sliding around. So it's kind of like, are you guys as far forward as you can go? Yes, you are. And that inertia block be pushed back? Yeah, in. a little bit. You can kind of look at this. Yeah, and just kind of stick it in And you'll also feel it. And then wiggle stuff around. No beating is required. Yeah. You should be yeah, just like pushing that. Just push the slave out. Pushed it right out. Oh, look, it's going the right way. Just like it's supposed to. What did I do wrong? Oh, didn't get it back far enough. Okay, let's put hammer springs, hammer springs back, back in. in. Yeah. And I didn't keep track of which side was Yeah, and it doesn't matter. I don't think so. No. So the back end goes in first. And there's a little hole in the back of the hammer where the, the rod goes. And these things are pretty easy to cock when it's not in the gun. So let's have it over there. So it should fire the right hammer and see if it see if the rest and the block move around by themselves. It did. Yep. Yep. So that's working. Right, and you just demonstrated there just simply that the uh, the hammer alone is <laughs> enough to reset that thing. Yeah, to thing. get it going. Yeah. Okay. So moving right along. So to put this back together, there's, uh, I don't know what to call it, a radius at the top of the back of this as well as a, mm -hmm. a radius area in the front so they're like keyed. The trigger plate is keyed into the receiver. So you want to make sure especially that the rear one gets up in there and, and, and it won't go in because why? Hammers. The hammers aren't cocked. I'm just going to start these in. Right. So you could do this. Get one of your French. No, get a pitcher full of your French sapphires. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> and after the first one, then take a real good look at it. Yeah. And say okay, maybe next time. No, I can see now. I mean, the, it's just the there, the fiddly part. It's not. It. It's not difficult. Either. The fiddly part is getting the spring yeah, just, in there to you know, just and that's just a matter of right. And then and getting those levers and under. And the only thing you need the hammer for is to get that one that roll pin roll pin move, so you can get the levers out of it. Levers will fall out of them without that. Yeah. But to get the trigger out of the receiver itself, out of the trigger block or whatever that's called, you do need uh, to get that pin out of there. Work. 
Okay. It's all good. Yeah. So, excuse me, Steve, but to, well, I don't need to recock it yet. But I do need, I think I'm going to need to use the vise. Sets or they well, keep. I need to do a couple of things. I need to get this turned straight. straight. Why? Because the gold screw goes into a pocket underneath it. It's in the receiver, and there's a cutout in the big screw where this goes through it. Yeah, it's an interesting locking mechanism. It's that pocket that that little screw goes into that really is, that holds it together. From yeah. Time. Before we were looking at that, going, how can that little screw act as a set screw? Well, actually, yeah, does it really good. I guess a guy could put some blue Loctite on that, but. I don't think it's that big a deal. So that's tight, that's tight. Those are down. Now you just got to make sure you get that thing in the... Um, yeah, the, uh, the lever the into the selector, which it says it's going to fire the bottom barrel first, so I want the, the floppy part over on the right side, so that'll go in it and get through the springs here and everything. And it is possible to put it together in the wrong spot. Don't ask me how I know. Yeah. And you want the springs to be under the pin. The spring has like a V bend in it, so when the selector is either on safe or, you know, in the shooting mode, it's on the downhill side. So to push it all the way through, you usually have to do something with the other side of it here. And then I try to push it through so it's about equal distance on either side of pin coming through. So this should go back and forth, safe, not. You can see where not on safe the trigger, the trigger comes up right back in here and on safe it's blocked. It's a mechanical block. And there's another safety in this also, that when the lever is opened up, this piece drops down and you cannot pull the trigger, pull right. the trigger right. while the gun's open. Right. Okay, so I, I hope that answers some of the questions you guys might have had about what's going on inside of a, a 680 series receiver. Uh, as you, you saw, it's, it's not really difficult, but it is tedious. There's a it, it's hard. It's not hard. It just takes time it's to get just, those yeah. things lined up. Yeah, I would recommend not drinking a bunch of coffee before trying no. to put it back together. Or um, being old with the shakes like that. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, after seeing it, it can be done. It doesn't look like it's that complicated. No. It's just the little fiddly parts of, that, of, of getting it back together um, and, and don't lose or don't have anything go flying off and yeah. disappear on you or anything like that. I think if you're really methodical about laying everything out in order, um, and just being careful as you do it and have a lot of patience that, um, you know, you should be able to do it no problem. Because I did. <laughs> if well, I you've can, done anybody can. three or four now, so yeah, you're becoming an expert on this. Yeah, I wouldn't say so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if you have any questions or anything, um, powerfactorshow.com, uh, you can go to there. Uh, powerfactorshow at gmail.com is the email address. And then the um, ever popular facebook.com slash powerfactorshow. We've been actually a lot more active on there mm -hmm. than we have in the past, um, posting generally, you know, just things that we think that you guys would be interested in but also having more of a dialogue uh, with you as our viewers. So that's probably the, one of the more popular places to go to these days. So again, hope you enjoyed the episode and uh, we'll see you next time.
Hi, Power Factor fans. Uh, I just want to do a little quick segment. Um, even though the show is mostly about competition, um, we've also done some stuff about fun guns and stuff that we'd like to, other interests we have in shooting. And something kind of interesting happened to me. I, I'd uh, written a, just a post on, a, on our forum, our club's forum, about a Webley revolver that I have. Um, and a guy uh, took me aside at the match last Saturday and said, oh, you know, you, you're interested in Webley. Come and take a look at this. And so I'm expecting it to be one of the British uh, military Webley revolvers, which most people are familiar with. If you never served in the British Army, you probably are familiar with it, um, the top break uh, from uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. There's a scene where he's got his revolver and he breaks it open and you see that it's empty. And so those are the guns that most Americans are probably familiar with. And those guns served in the British military military from the 18 late 1880s i think past the end of world war ii um, they were still using break top revolvers in 38 caliber so that's the classic british revolver and so that's what i was expecting probably a mark six which is the the service revolver from the world war one era so the guy takes me aside opens the box and it turns out uh, i didn't know the model at the time but it's a solid frame revolver with a loading gate on the side, sort of like a, a Colt single action. And it had some weird features I wasn't really familiar with, but I'm like going, okay, you know, this looks like uh, guns I've seen pictures of, but I just didn't know much about it. So I went home, started doing some research, and it turns out it's the, uh, the well-known and justifiably famous uh, Webley RIC number one, first model, I think is what it's called. And I think it was made for one or two years. It was introduced around 1870. Um, it was Webley's first double action design. And it's got a kind of an interesting history. It's called the RIC, that's short for Royal Irish Constabulary, which was a police force. And they were the first customer for it. And that name just stuck. It was always called the RIC model. And it went through a progression of different models. Like I said, this is the RIC number one. Uh, first issue, then there was like the second issue or second pattern or something, and then the number two and the number three. And it doesn't seem like any one of them was made for more than a couple of years. Because, I mean, if I just went on, uh, like, Googled uh, Webley RIC, clicked on images, and no two guns seemed to look quite alike. And so they, it was fairly rapid uh, development. And so this is the first issue. Again, made about 1870. It's soaking now. I'm um, trying to get some of the rust off of it. And uh, I guess I can get a little bit closer to the camera. As you can see, it's got, you know, kind of classic uh, 19th century design. It's got the V-shaped mainspring. Um, you'll also see that the trigger guard is missing. Um, but it's, uh, it's chambered in the .442 cartridge, which I believe this is the only gun ever made that was chambered in that cartridge. And uh, it normally, I think for Americans, it would be just kind of like a footnote in firearms development just because uh, it is a solid frame, double action. Uh, but the interesting thing about it, and something that I, that I actually thought about it when I first saw the gun, is uh, if you're familiar with your American history, you'll know that um, in 1876, uh, the U.S. Army suffered one of its greatest defeats uh, up to that time um, at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Uh, General Custer, Lieutenant Colonel Custer, uh, took the 7th Cavalry, uh, took on a few too many natives, and uh, met his demise. But uh, the rumor is that uh, as his personal sidearm or sidearms, Custer carried uh, the RIC number one first issue. And apparently the, the, the second issue or second pattern or whatever they called it came out late enough that it would be very unlikely that Custer could have had one in the summer of 1876. And so uh, it's believed that this is the exact model. And in the condition of this thing, I'm wondering if this isn't actually one of his revolvers. Uh, it looks like it's been buried in the Montana dirt for uh, 140 years. But kind of the interesting thing about it is that I was cycling the action and it didn't work very well. And I was trying to figure out there must be a piece that's broken or damaged. And you'll see that there's no trigger guard on it. Well, there's an action spring that goes in the front of the frame here. Um, that is essentially the trigger return spring, and that spring is retained by the trigger guard. So as soon as you lose your trigger guard, uh, the gun isn't going to work anymore. And it was I, 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 in doing my research, I found a really cool diagram 
that shows the internal workings of the gun. And you can see here, handily already circled are these two action springs. Um, this lower uh, V spring is the trigger return spring, and then there's a smaller flat spring that uh, keeps upward pressure. I, I think uh, in American revolvers, this part's called the bolt. One of the interesting things about the revolver is that the locking notches in the cylinder are at the front. Um, most American revolvers, in fact, all American revolvers I'm familiar with, uh, the locking notches are at the rear of the cylinder. So this bolt goes up through the uh, front of the window in the frame and locks into a notch in the front of the cylinder. But I'm missing this spring and this little flat spring. And I think I'm going to be able to uh, maybe just cut off a piece of, uh, of a magazine spring and replace this small flat spring with a piece of wire, um, at least enough to get the thing to lock up properly. And then if I can find a trigger guard, I think a V-spring like this wouldn't be too tough to either make um, from a spring designed for something else if I can't find it. So many guns from the 19th century had these V-springs in it. I don't think it'll be tough to find one, maybe even one from another Webley to replace that. But I'm hoping to get a trigger guard for it. If you know anybody who uh, deals in old British gun parts and you can get a trigger guard for a RIC number one first pattern or whatever it's called, uh, let me know. I'd be very interested in having, of course, any of the screws to retain it as well. But uh, So that's my little project that I'm working on and I'm hopefully, I don't know about getting the thing shooting um, a gun made in 1870, not, as it, not only is it old, but of course it's probably made out of uh, fairly weak iron uh, designed to contain black powder cartridge uh, levels of pressure and pressure curve and whatnot. So unless I could find some... Fo now, my, the guy who gave me the gun actually demonstrated that a 45 gap cartridge fits perfectly in the cylinder, which I thought was kind of unlikely um, since it's rimless and whatnot. But I'm sure the gun operates at you know about half the pressure of 45 gap, and of course uh, black powder is a completely different pressure curve than uh, smokeless powder. So I'm sure uh, that would be a bad idea. But at least it's interesting in terms of uh, dimensions. Um, it could serve maybe as a conversion case if this thing were ever to be fired, and I don't know that we'll ever get there. But anyway, so it's my little project getting the RIC number one, uh, at least getting it so that the cylinder turns and the trigger resets and uh, I'll see maybe we'll do a follow-up uh, episode later um, see if I've made any progress but uh, if you have any interest in the Webley uh, check it out there's a couple of demonstration videos on YouTube of various models not obviously this exact model but uh, it's interesting it's got a very interesting um, ejector system that uh, evolved over time this one uh, the ejector actually is mounted on a sleeve on the barrel you pull the pin out until it's clear of the frame rotate uh, rotate it out to about four o'clock from the shooter's perspective so it aligns with the, the cylinder and the loading gate and then when you're done punching the empties out one at a time you rotate the thing back down to six o'clock and then the um, that ejector pin runs through a hollow cylinder pin and part of the issue that I'm having is that the, the ejector pin is frozen inside this collar, which is then in turn frozen to the cylinder base pin, and then it's also frozen to the barrel. So I can't get any of that stuff out or get it to work. I don't really need to get the gun apart. I don't think I'm ever going to try to shoot it, but it would be nice to get the cylinder out and get access to the uh, inside of it to just kind of clean it up and whatnot. But if I make any progress, I'll uh, do a follow-up report. And uh, until then, see you at the range. Bam 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 b